Thank you very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here with you today, and I want to begin by uh, offering my congratulations to Helio and to the Mises Institute Brazil for uh, their great success in all of their activities and operations, and especially in putting uh, this conference together. Uh, I, I am in strong agreement with the previous speaker that to be a good Austrian economist, one must be a generalist and not a specialist. However, I am delighted that I do not have to explain the entire history of the Austrian school in one lecture, but rather I can focus on a specific topic, namely the economics of the entrepreneur and the place of entrepreneurship in economic science. As many of you know, uh, entrepreneurship is becoming increasingly popular as a subject of discussion in academia, in politics, in economic development, and in many other walks of life. Uh, I call it the entrepreneurship phenomenon, meaning the increase in attention that is devoted to entrepreneurship in many parts of society. Uh, you have at the universities an increasing number of entrepreneurship courses in business schools, also in other parts of the university. Uh, you have uh, entrepreneurship journals this, uh, in, in academic research, uh, publications that specialize in mainstream research in entrepreneurship. You have many uh, university research centers, and here are just a few that I've chosen at random, one at Stanford, one at the University of Illinois, and one at MIT, uh, some of which have uh, uh, very substantial amounts of resources devoted to uh, uh, teaching entrepreneurship, research in entrepreneurship, doing outreach and policy work in entrepreneurship as well. There are some private foundations. The Kauffman Foundation is uh, uh, the largest one that specializes in supporting entrepreneurship research and entrepreneurship activities. Uh, even uh, within the, uh, among policymakers, and development experts, World Bank, IMF, and so on, they all talk about entrepreneurship as an important means for economic development. You know, this is Muhammad Yunus, uh, the uh, Nobel Peace Laureate in 2008 or 2009, a specialist in microenterprise and microfinance, uh, also an economist, of course, and many people uh, saw the Nobel Peace Prize to Mr. Yunus as a recognition by the sort of international policy elites uh, that entrepreneurship is a key to social change and maybe even the path to peace. The word entrepreneur and words like entrepreneurship, entrepreneurial, uh, they're used in many, many different ways in different contexts. And it isn't always very clear what what does it mean? What does it mean to be an entrepreneur? What does it mean to act in an entrepreneurial way? People have many different things in mind when they use these words. For example, sometimes they think of uh, uh, people who start important companies, right? So there's Bill Gates, uh, 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 the co-founder of Microsoft along with Paul Allen. So often the word entrepreneur is used to describe people like this, uh, people who start small companies that grow and become very large. Uh, sometimes entrepreneur is used to refer to innovators. This is uh, Mr. Edison, Thomas Edison, of course. Uh, maybe you think of uh, uh, an older generation of industrialists like John D. Rockefeller. These are innovators who create new industries, who create new products and services, make them available to consumers. Sometimes the word entrepreneurship is used to describe specific companies. So we might say that Google or Apple, or to take a, a, a somewhat older industrial example, 3M, that these are entrepreneurial companies. Whereas uh, you know, Petrobras is not an entrepreneurial company. Right, So we often use the word entrepreneurial as an adjective, and we use it to describe particular kinds of organizations that are 
uh, more dynamic, more innovative, uh, more exciting, more creative, and so on. Uh, we might even use the word entrepreneurial to describe a whole culture or an entire society. We might say Brazil is a very vibrant and dynamic and entrepreneurial society with a lot of economic change, high economic growth, whereas uh, country, where's, where's Professor Hulsman? France, for example, that's not a very entrepreneurial society. It's a bureaucratic society, we might say. Uh, one of the uh, most important mainstream entrepreneurship scholars, uh, David Audrish, has a new book out called The Entrepreneurial Society. Uh, some uh, scholars associated with the Kauffman Foundation produced a book two years ago called Good Capitalism, Bad Capitalism. Not an Austrian book, but they make some interesting points about uh, contrasting two kinds of economic systems, what they call entrepreneurial capitalism and what they call bureaucratic capitalism as two different means of organizing a, a sort of a more or less private enterprise system. But what does it mean? What does it mean for an economy or a, co or a company or a person, an individual, to be entrepreneurial as opposed to something else, something that is not entrepreneurial? Well, I have found in reading the mainstream literature on entrepreneurship, uh, it helps to have some definitions or some ideas in mind because in the literature, words like entrepreneur, entrepreneurship, entrepreneurial are used in many, many different ways and they often mean very, very different things. Now, one way of sort of classifying the literature that I have found helpful is to think of it in the following way. What I call sort of the mainstream perspective, the idea of entrepreneurship as an outcome or a phenomenon, meaning that entrepreneurship is something that you can see with your eyes, you can measure with numbers, and you can analyze using standard economic tools. For example, entrepreneurship might be defined as self-employment or startup companies or maybe the art of managing a small company, or maybe the act of introducing new products. So if entrepreneurship is just about startup companies, well, we can count the number of startup companies in a society or in a community. We can count or measure the percent of the population that is, for example, self-employed. Uh, we can write books on how to do it small business, starting a business for dummies. Okay, if that's what entrepreneurship is, we can, we can grasp it, we can see it with our eyes, we can study it using mainstream economic tools, categories, concepts, and so on. Sorry, there's a, a to my friend in the back, there's a mistake with the slide here, with the picture in the wrong place. Um, what, what, uh, if you read the Austrian literature on entrepreneurship, you find the entrepreneur and entrepreneurship described not as a phenomenon or outcome, but as a fundamental aspect of economic behavior, a fundamental aspect of economic behavior, a way of thinking, a way of acting, a way of reasoning uh, 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 with, with the things that are around us. For example, in Mises, the broad sense of entrepreneurship the broad definition of entrepreneurship is that of acting under uncertainty. So human action under conditions of uncertainty provides the broad definition of entrepreneurship in Mises, according to Mises. We might also think of a narrower, a narrower definition, a sort of business entrepreneurship or market entrepreneurship, or to use the word, uh, catalactic entrepreneurship, but I agree it's not the best word, but this is the word that Mises used, uh, which we might define as you know, the deployment of resources, of heterogeneous capital resources, in pursuit of monetary gains, money profit, and the, uh, in a, an attempt to avoid monetary loss. Now, 
Is entrepreneurship something new in economics? Certainly not. Indeed, what is generally considered the oldest, uh, the, the, the first systematic treatise on economic science, the essay by Richard Cantillon, or Cantillon, uh, the essay uh, uh, on the nature of commerce in general, written probably in the 1730s, first published in 1755, the first systematic treatise, book-length treatise on economics, is fundamentally about the entrepreneur. Cantillon gives the entrepreneur a central place in his economic system. Many of the important economists from the classical and early neoclassical period, scholars such as Jean-Baptiste Say, and of course Karl Menger, the founder of the Austrian school, all gave the entrepreneur a very important role in their theories. Some of the most important 20th century economists, such as Joseph Schumpeter, Austrian by birth, though not strictly speaking a part of the Austrian school, the American economist Frank Knight, and uh, more recently uh, writers such as Israel Kirzner and the Nobel laureate Theodore Schultz, have all written about the entrepreneur, have all produced important writings on the nature and implications and, and sort of meaning of the entrepreneur and entrepreneurship. However, in modern mainstream neoclassical economics, so around uh, you know, the, the post-World War II period, the era of Samuelson, the Samuelson textbook, the sort of neo-Keynesian synthesis with uh, formal mathematical equilibrium microeconomics combined with some form of Keynesian macroeconomics. Within this tradition, the entrepreneur dropped out. The entrepreneur gradually disappeared from mainstream treatments of organizations and markets. Indeed, uh, those of you, the students and, and others who have taken courses at the university in economics, unless you were very lucky, you may have taken an entire program in economics without ever hearing the word entrepreneur. In the most popular textbooks, undergraduate and even many graduate textbooks in economics, the word entrepreneur does not even appear in the index. It's not considered a part of economic analysis. There is no role for the entrepreneur. Why? Well, uh, uh, some of it has to do with the language in which economics came to be expressed after World War II. So the emphasis on formal equilibrium modeling, mathematical modeling of equilibrium conditions, you know, in, in, a, in a sort of uh, Valrasian general equilibrium state where all resources are by hypothesis already allocated to their highest valued uses, there is no role for the entrepreneur to play. There's no need for an entrepreneur. There is no, entrepreneurship is assumed away by definition. Now, Mises, of course, as many of you know, also employed a kind of general equilibrium construct, what he called the evenly rotating economy. But Mises used this construct only in a very specific and limited sense for a rather narrow purpose. He did not analyze the evenly rotating economy as the basic you know, means of explaining market phenomena. By contrast, within mainstream neoclassical economics, formal equilibrium models are the standard tools that are used to explain all kinds of everyday economic phenomena. So if you use a, a formal equilibrium model, a mathematical equilibrium model, to analyze things in economics, why would you need to consider the entrepreneur? Why would you need to bring the entrepreneur into your analysis, you wouldn't. Uh, in microeconomic theory, the sort of uh, central role played by the model of perfect competition, so-called perfect competition, and many of you have studied this in school, right? Uh, you know, infinitely small buyers and sellers, price takers, none of whom has any influence on prices, quantities, and so on. Again, this is a completely static model in which entrepreneurship is assumed not to exist. 
Okay? Now, within the last few years, 10 years, 15 years maybe, there has been a little bit of new interest in entrepreneurship within some fields of mainstream economics. Uh, there's a literature on innovation in which entrepreneurship is occasionally invoked, maybe as a synonym for innovator or innovation. Uh, in some of the economic development literature, there's a sense that maybe uh, a way to foster sustainable economic growth is not to have the World Bank and USAID and the IMF you know, give money to state planners to build roads and dams, but maybe to try to foster a culture in which, sorry, in which many individuals in the community will engage in entrepreneurial activity and have some sort of bottom-up development rather than top-down development. But again, even in those literatures, entrepreneurship is, well, the mainstream practitioners are a little uncomfortable with the concept. They think, they sense that it is somehow important, but they don't quite know how to handle it. Now, the Austrian school, of course, is quite different in this regard. The Austrians have always given central importance to the entrepreneur in their theories, in their models of economic activity. Uh, Cantillon, I already mentioned, could be considered a sort of proto-Austrian or pre-Austrian thinker. Uh, Karl Menger, while not, giving, uh, not explaining entrepreneurship in as much detail as some later Austrians would do, nonetheless explains very clearly that, what, uh, that the entrepreneur is the, is the force that is responsible, the agent responsible for allocating resources for organizing production in a market economy. Uh, the writers, sometimes known as the Anglo-American Austrians, so writers in uh, Britain and in the US, such as uh, uh, Frank Fetter, Herbert Davenport, Philip Wicksteed, to some extent uh, John Bates Clark, uh, provided some very fund fundamental analysis of the entrepreneur as a central agent in their theories of market competition and uh, economic production. Uh, Mises, of course, devotes a lot of attention in his works, human action in particular, to entrepreneurship and the role of the entrepreneur. I'll discuss in just a few moments in a little bit more detail how I see Mises' conception of the entrepreneur. Uh, Murray Rothbard, as well, discusses entrepreneurship in great detail in Man, Economy, and State, and in other works. Uh, Israel Kirzner, who was mentioned this morning, is a more recent specialist in uh, entrepreneurship from an Austrian perspective, a, a sort of unique Austrian perspective. Uh, also, the uh, less well-known uh, 20th century economist Ludwig Lachmann, who became better known by modern Austrians for his epistemological writings, but whose most important contributions, I think, are in uh, his development of Austrian capital theory. Uh, discusses the entrepreneur in, in uh, has very important insights on entrepreneurship in his 1956 book, Capital and Its Structure. Mises puts it as follows. Mises says, it is impossible to eliminate the entrepreneur from the picture of a market economy. The various complementary factors of production cannot come together spontaneously. They need to be combined by the purpose of efforts of men aiming at certain ends and motivated by the urge to improve their state of satisfaction. Right, that's the definition of purposeful human action, according to Mises. In eliminating the entrepreneur, one eliminates the driving force of the whole market system. In eliminating the entrepreneur, one eliminates the driving force of the market. You might have heard this phrase before, entrepreneurship as the driving force of the market. What does Mises have in mind with that term? He has in mind the agent that brings together the complementary factors of production, combining them in purposeful ways to achieve particular ends, namely in a catalactic context to make money 
to earn money revenues that are in excess of money costs or expenditures. So uh, a little, little bit more detail about uh, Mises and how Mises treats entrepreneurship. Again, there's sort of a, a more general or, or fundamental aspect of entrepreneurship and then a more narrow and specific aspect of market or business or catalactic entrepreneurship. Well, as was already discussed this morning, and as, you, as, as uh, most of you know, uh, Carl Menger's analysis of economic process and economic behavior was different from that of his neoclassical contemporaries, such as uh, Jevons and Valraz, in that Menger was an Aristotelian, he emphasized causal relations and stressed that economics was ultimately the study of means and ends. That economic action is about the employment of scarce means to achieve specific ends. However, as was also discussed this morning, when one introduces time and uncertainty into the analysis, we recognize that the human actor in assembling resources, in choosing among means to attain specific ends, does not know with certainty that those ends will in fact be realized. There's an investment. The investment may pay off. Maybe it doesn't pay off. So all of you who are attending this workshop, this seminar today, uh, it cost you some money, registration fees, maybe transportation costs or accommodation costs to come here to Porto Alegre. Uh, there's an investment of your time. You could be doing something else this morning instead of coming here. So you have made some expenditures up front. Why do you do it? Because you hope that you will receive a huge benefit, a subjective benefit, uh, learning new information, improving your understanding of the Austrian tradition, seeing famous celebrity professors, you know, <laughs> making new friends, networking, improving your networking, and so on. These are all benefits which you hope to achieve, and it's certainly the goal of, of, of the organizers and the speakers that when you go home tomorrow, you will be very, very satisfied, and you will in your own subjective assessment, the benefits that you have received will be much more valuable than what you sacrificed to come. Now, it's possible, extremely unlikely, but theoretically possible, that you might go home disappointed and say, what a waste of time and money. Those guys were terrible. I couldn't understand anything that they said. Uh, Klein had a mistake on his PowerPoint and it ruined the whole thing. Uh, and then we would say you've earned a, a loss, right? So th my point is, you are acting as entrepreneurs in a sense that you have employed scarce means to achieve particular ends, but there's some uncertainty because of the passage of time. The, the ends will, you, you'll, you will not know if you have satisfied your ends until the future, at which point the means have already been used, the expenditures have already been made. So entrepreneurship can be successful. It can earn a profit, a money profit, or a subjective psychic profit. Or it can be unsuccessful. It can earn a loss. So uh, as Mises puts it, the term entrepreneur, as used by economic theory, means acting man seen exclusively, exclusively seen from the aspect of the uncertainty inherent in every action. So human action, all purposeful human action, includes a measure of entrepreneurship. However, there's also a more uh, sort of a narrow kind of catalactic or market or business entrepreneurship that is especially important in our study of markets and economic processes. So Mises and Austrian economic theory emphasize that the entrepreneur performs a distinct economic function. So we may think of different actors, different agents in a market economy performing different roles. So uh, 
think of sort of ideal types, Weberian ideal types. We have laborers who in, exchange labor services for payments, wages, and salaries. We have landowners who uh, uh, rent the use of their land in exchange for payments, rental payments. We have capitalists who own financial resources and make those available in advance to borrowers in exchange for payments, interest payments, on the use of those resources. But we have another category of actor, the entrepreneurs, the returns to which are economic profit and economic loss. So the businessman rents some land and he hires some workers, he borrows some money, he produces some goods and services, he sells them on the market. If the receipts that he receives from selling his goods and services on the market are greater than the amount of money he has spent on wages and rents and interest, then controlling uh, uh, for disc uh, discounting and time preference, if he has more left over, then he has a profit. The profit is the extra revenues that are in excess of his economic costs, taking the time value of money into account. Uh, if he is unable to sell his goods and services as much as he expected, or he cannot charge as high a price as he wanted, maybe he ends up with a, a smaller amount of money as revenues than he spent in cost. He has an economic loss. So profit and loss, if you like, are the returns or the rewards to the exercise of entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurs earn either profit or loss, while uh, laborers earn wages, landowners earn rent, capitalists earn interest, and so on. Note, as, I, as in my example from a, a moment ago, profit and loss could be measured in money, but if we like, we could measure it subjectively. Uh, some, some business people might just get enjoyment out of uh, doing what they do, being, being your own boss, making an exciting product, there's some sort of adventure in being engaged in business activity. We could count that as part of the profit, part of the reward, even if it isn't monetized. Uh, in the Austrian conception, profit is not a rate of return, as in the neoclassical theory of the firm. And you, you have this notion that, well, you know, there's a normal rate of profit in an industry and if a firm is earning more than that normal rate of profit, it must be doing something bad. It, it must be a monopoly. The government should do something you know, with antitrust or regulation or whatever. In the Austrian concept, there, there's no, profit is not a rate that's sort of earned normally by everyone, right? Profits and losses are amounts, and they vary according to the individual entrepreneur, according to the business, according to the market, circumstances, time and place, and so on. Uh, what are these resources that the entrepreneur possesses? Well, they can be you know, machines, tools, computers, etc., land, natural resources. Time can be considered a, a, a resource, op the opportunity cost of one's time, one's own body, and so on. Um, an interesting passage in Mises, he points out, he says, uh, you know, in using the term entrepreneur, Mises says, nobody thinks of shoeshine boys, cab drivers who own their cars, small businessmen, and small farmers, because we all think of Bill Gates, right? Still, what economics establishes with regard to entrepreneurs is rigidly valid for all members of the class without any regard to temporal and geographical conditions and to the various branches of business. What Mises means is the shoeshine boy who sets up his little shop and has to purchase the materials and so on and hope that he can earn enough money from shining shoes to cover his costs, the small businessman, the small farmer and so on, are all entrepreneurs because the rewards that they get are not guaranteed. Their returns are not certain. They are business actors under conditions of uncertainty. So they earn profits or losses, okay? Now, Mises' discussion of the entrepreneur is, it has some subtlety to it and some complexity. There's some ambiguity or nuance. 
Mises also refers to a specific class of entrepreneur, what he calls the entrepreneur, or what we might call the entrepreneur promoter. Let me quote from Mises. Economics also calls entrepreneurs those who are especially eager to profit from adjusting production to the expected changes in conditions. Those who have more initiative, more venturesomeness, and a quicker eye than the crowd, the pushing and promoting pioneers of economic improvement. He calls these actors or these agents promoters. In other words, we might define a special class of entrepreneur that not only employs scarce means under conditions of uncertainty in hopes of achieving definite ends, but also is particularly eager, has uh, extra initiative, uh, is creative, is ambitious, pushes and promotes uh, the market. And these are the kind of individuals that we think of when we think of Bill Gates or Thomas Edison or John D. Rockefeller and so on, the ones whose actions are really, really important. Okay? So you might say, well, Klein is an entrepreneur because he does, you know, I do some consulting projects and I have to pay for my time and materials and uh, some firms might pay me and I might earn a little profit or a little loss in my consulting business. So I, I'm an, uh, technically speaking, I'm an entrepreneur. Any consulting income that I earn would be classified by economic science as profit, or if, if, if it's the opposite loss. Nonetheless, I'm not exactly what you would call an important entrepreneur. In other words, my actions in the market do not sort of move the economy the way that uh, Steve Jobs, the actions of Steve Jobs move the economy, or Bill Gates, or, or uh, Warren Buffett, or who, whoever you want to name, or Helio, right? So Helio is an entrepreneur whose actions really have a big impact on life and culture and the economy of Brazil. I'm technically an entrepreneur, but I'm not a promoter, okay? I'm just not a very important kind of entrepreneur, but that's okay, I can, I can live with that. Uh, so the, what are these promoters like? Well, they own you know, substantial amounts of capital. They're particularly alert to opportunities to make money on their capital. They're creative, they're good leaders, and so on. Notice, this is not a purely praxeological concept. The concept of the promoter is a slightly more loosely defined, historically contingent category. So we can look at Steve Jobs or Helio and, and say, okay, he's a promoter, but it's not a strict praxeological category in the sen same sense of uh, as laborer or entrepreneur more generally. Okay? So when we think about promoters, promoter entrepreneurs, we're really bringing together the entrepreneur function and the capitalist function. So in practice, the capitalist and the entrepreneur are one and the same. So, under conditions of uncertainty, those who own capital earn not only interest due to time preference, but also they earn profit or loss because they invest their capital under conditions of uncertainty. So, what is the business firm? Well, if you like, it's the nexus in which the capitalist function and the entrepreneur function come together. It's a very important subject, so important that there is a recent book that I urge you to buy called The Capitalist and the Entrepreneur, Essays on Organizations and Markets, which is available outside in the lobby. And you can probably get a signature, an autographed copy, if, you, if you're lucky, uh, that explains uh, sort of the theory of the business firm by bringing together the capitalist and the entrepreneur. You know, why is Austrian economics particularly useful or insightful in understanding the capitalist and the entrepreneur together? Well, there are many important uh, concepts, Austrian concepts, Austrian insights, uh, the notion of capital resources as heterogeneous, fundamental to the Austrian theory of capital, 
right, if all resources were identical, then it would not take very much entrepreneurial skill. It would not take much skill as a promoter to combine them and organize them and use them to earn profits. Anybody could do it. But resources are, in fact, heterogeneous and subjectively perceived by entrepreneurs as emphasized by the Austrian school. This is why the act of combining resources is a, a very important skill that uh, not everyone possesses, okay? Uh, production takes time, as emphasized by the Austrian theory of production and the business cycle and so on. Uh, entrepreneurs engage in economic calculation. So economic calculation, as defined by Mises, is not, an not simply an economy-wide issue that you know, central planners cannot perform and so on. Economic calculation is the tool used by entrepreneurs as they forecast future uh, revenues and compare them against present costs. Uh, and of course, there is competition in the market as the market selects for entrepreneurial skill. Those who are consistently good at entrepreneurship are able to attract, you know, they earn profits, they're able to increase their capital stock and have an even greater effect on the allocation of resources in the market. Those who are unsuccessful find themselves competed out and they eventually exit the market. Okay? Um, I, uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip some material on more specific you know, within the Austrian literature, there are some differences, for example. Uh, Kirzner has this notion of entrepreneurship as alertness, what I view as close to Mises' notion of the promoter. Uh, Schumpeter, sort of Austrian fellow traveler, emphasized entrepreneurship as innovation. I judge Mises to be closer to Frank Knight, who developed a concept of entrepreneurship as judgment, which I discuss uh, in my book. Uh, as Lachman put it in Capital and Its Structure, we are living in a world of unexpected change. Hence, capital combinations will ever be changing, will be dissolved and reformed. In this activity, we find the real function of the entrepreneur. So in a market economy, the real function of the entrepreneur is this combining and recombining of heterogeneous capital resources under conditions of uncertainty. Now, there are a number of you know, uh, applications, extensions uh, that, that one might cover, uh, wish to discuss that I cover in some of my works. Uh, I have a new book that will be coming out later this year called Entrepreneurial Judgment and the Theory of the Firm. It's just uh, at the final manuscript stage with the, with the book, uh, the publisher, um, where, among other things, my co-author Nikolai Foss and I discuss how Mises' notion of entrepreneurship extends to the large firm. And we argue that large firms can also be entrepreneurial. Entrepreneurship is not exclusively a property of the small firm or the young firm. It's not just about startups, more complex, hierarchical, mature companies also act entrepreneurially and have special ways of trying to make uh, their organizations more entrepreneurial. So we discuss, for example, the notion of the multi-person firm as a nested hierarchy of entrepreneurial judgment. I have some quotations about that which I'll skip. So the very last thing I want to say, uh, you know, is entrepreneurship something that the government should try to promote, encourage? Uh, is government intervention harmful or helpful to entrepreneurship? Well, I won't keep you in suspense any longer. It's mostly harmful, okay? I don't want to shock anyone here coming to an Austrian con conference. Uh, but uh, a government intervention has a number of harmful effects on entrepreneurship. In the macroeconomic sense, which other speakers will discuss in more detail, right, credit expansion and the uh, creation of inflation, uh, money inflation leading to price inflation, not only has undesirable consequences in the aggregate, 
sort of you know, lengthening the structure of production, setting in motion the business cycle, and so on. But from a more microeconomic perspective, uh, monetary expansion, credit expansion, also distorts the signals of profit and loss that are essential for the entrepreneurial mechanism. It makes it more difficult for entrepreneurs to exercise judgment about future market conditions. Thank you. Uh, uh, the government response to the financial crisis, the bailouts, the subsidies, and so on, you know, have exactly the opposite effect of, of making the economy better, right? Entrepreneurship, as emphasized by Mises in his 1951 essay, Profit and Loss, is not just about earning profits, but avoiding losses. It is essential that those economic actors who act as entrepreneurs or promoters, but don't do it well, but are not very good at anticipating future market conditions, at forming expectations about what goods and services consumers will want to buy. People who do that and uh, do not earn revenues in excess of their costs, who earn economic losses, should not be entrepreneurs any longer. And a, a successful, a vibrant economic system, a vibrant and uh, a successful market economy is one in which people are free to earn profits and free to earn losses. Policies that protect the uh, entrepreneurs from loss, that subsidize or bail out those who have made unwise judgments about the future are harmful to the process of resource allocation. Now, uh, you know, a lot of government agencies use the word entrepreneur and they say, oh, we're going to make entrepreneurship better with special training programs for young entrepreneurs and we're going to subsidize have government funding for research and development and uh, uh, government funded incubators to try to train people how to start businesses and so on. Well, aside from the usual issues that Austrian economists would raise about the ability of government planners to engage in these kinds of activities in a reasonable, in an efficient way, right? Also keep in mind that from the Austrian point of view, there is no optimal ratio of small business to large business, new firms to old firms, high growth firms to low growth firms. This is something that can only be worked out through free and open competition on the market. So when government planners say we need more startups, we need more small firms, so we're going to subsidize them with tax money. Well, I mean, that may lead to too many small firms where the market may prefer a greater number of large firms, right? The government cannot, can no more centrally plan the size and age distribution of firms, the location of an innovative cluster like Silicon Valley, which industries are the most entrepreneurial and should get the t tax money and so on. Government can no more do that than it can plan any aspect of economic activity, it, namely it can't. So the best government policy to promote entrepreneurship is the simple one, right? Sound money, secure property rights, and economic liberty. So if the government will allow the market process to operate, that is the best thing the government can do to promote entrepreneurship, to allow entrepreneurship to flourish, and to lead uh, to, to do uh, what is possible to promote economic prosperity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter Klein. I invite you to come to this side of the podium. E nós vamos fazer, como da outra vez, um, uma rápida conversa, na verdade, novamente, apenas duas perguntas, porque a gente vai ser bem rígido com o tempo na volta do almoço, nós vamos voltar às duas horas pontualmente. Então, se alguém quiser começar colocando a pergunta, eu acho que não tem necessidade de ser por escrito. A gente pode passar o microfone. Algum comentário, alguma pergunta? Bom, nesse caso... Ah, por favor.
what's your vision about uh, if isn't it pointless to, to produce and to create innovative uh, wealth uh, in, in, the, in the fact that it's driven away? Okay, so, so the question is, if I understand correctly, in an interventionist economy in which the government extracts many resources, the government makes it difficult for entrepreneurs to earn profit, doesn't that reduce the incentive to engage in entrepreneurial activity? Yeah, and, and if, it is, uh, if it is not uh, contraproductive, like the, much, the, the better I, 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 I produce, better for, for the government and this is structure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, of course, I, I completely agree in the kind of historical, what Mises calls thymological sense, that in an economy with heavy amounts of government interference, where there are all these distortions, bailout subsidies and so on, I mean, why bother to be successful if A, I won't get to keep the fruits of my own labor to begin with, and B, I may be helping the government by giving it more tax revenue with which it can do horrible things and so on, then absolutely we would expect many individuals who could otherwise be successful promoters to, 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 sit, to sit, sit things out. Uh, that, well, he, you could even call that Atlas shrugging. How about that? Uh, Atlas might be more likely to shrug in those conditions. However, Mises points out that from a purely theoretical point of view, you know, Entrepreneurship is not something that we can measure quantitatively, right? Mises says, uh, Guido will remember the exact page, I'm sure. Uh, Mises talks about, you know, even in, uh, you know, in Soviet Russia, even in Nazi Germany, there are always those individuals who are, are striving to improve their situation, to make things for themselves and their families less bad than they otherwise would be. So one can never eliminate entrepreneurship altogether. Even in a totalitarian state, it is part of human nature for us to strive to make ourselves better off. But of course, the overall economic consequences would be much reduced or attenuated compared with the beneficial effects we would expect in a free society. Thank you. I think we have one participant finishing another question, so let's wait. <laughs> I have the headset if someone wishes to ans ask a question in Portuguese, the translator will translate it for me. This one is in Portuguese, Hélio Beltrão, I will try to... Quer que eu tenha? Should I put... Ah, okay. ah tá, tá com a tradução okay. simultânea, claro. See, just, just one okay. moment. Make sure it works. I have it turned on. Okay. Ok, qual a definição de monopólio o professor acha mais interessante economicamente dentro dessa visão sua exposta, claro, a neoclássica ou monopólio legal, governamental, garantir, ou seja, garantir reserva de mercado, garantindo a reserva de mercado? Ok, sim, yeah, so, uh, well, I much prefer the latter definition. Uh, as you may know, there are some differences in the Austrian school about monopoly. Mises' definition of monopoly is a little bit different from Rothbard's. Kirzner's definition is closer to Mises and uh, not quite the same as Rothbard's. Rothbard preferred the older sort of scholastic notion of monopoly as a government license or an exclusive government grant of a privilege, a government-created entry barrier, uh, compared to the neoclassical notion of a monopoly as a firm that has a high market share, or if a market has you know, 15 firms, it's competitive, but if a market only has three firms, it's a monopoly or an oligopoly. Mo I would agree with most Austrians in rejecting that mainstream notion that one can measure how monopolized or how competitive a market is by counting firms or by estimating market shares. There are a number of problems with that view. It's overly static, uh, the measurement is artificial, the definition of a market is arbitrary, and so on. But I would hold more to the Rothbardian view, that from the point of view of competition among entrepreneurs, all that is required is the absence of legal barriers to enter a particular business or a particular market. Federal Reserve 
Well, I imagine I only have about 30 seconds left to answer. Uh, so I won't, the, the question is, what do I mean by sound money? Well, I mean, look, I'm being deliberately agnostic for the point of view of this particular lecture because we have much more time during the conference to debate uh, the gold standard versus fractional reserve banking, 100% uh, reserves, fractional reserves, and so on. Um, so f f from the point of view of what I'm discussing here, all that's necessary is you know, a monetary system in which the state or the credit system does not distort the value of the monetary unit, right? So, uh, theoretically possible, sure. I mean, M Mises talks about uh, the importance of, well, Mises' theory of economic calculation is basically a monetary theory, right? Economic calculation is comparing these future revenues against present costs in a common unit with numbers. Right, so the you know the, the the conference attendee who decides whether or not to come to the conference and hopes to get benefits tomorrow and so on, that's not catalactic because the profit and loss cannot be measured in a number. You cannot measure your subjective utility from listening to me versus the subjective cost of not getting to do something else. The catalactic entrepreneur can measure benefits and costs in money. So you need a monetary economy with a monetary unit that is sufficiently stable to permit economic calculation. Now, whether that requires a gold standard, whether that's consistent with fractional reserve banking or fiat money, I leave that question to future speakers. Thank you, Peter Klein. Bom, a gente agradece então mais uma vez a presença de todos e lembrando que voltaremos pontualmente às duas horas porque temos uma programação bem bacana agora na tarde. Obrigada então mais uma vez a presença de todos.